Welcome, welcome very much to Conversations. We're pleased to welcome to the program Sarah Horowitz. And uh, Ms. Horowitz is the uh, president of a, of a really interesting organization that's been highlighted by Bob Herbert and others called Working Today. It's a newly emerging um, uh, pattern. And Sarah, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Thank you. Wonder if you might. Uh, we, we mentioned that uh, maybe you could share. Maybe the best thing for us to do. We want to talk about some of the implications of the emerging new workplace. Uh, this downsizing issue and that sort of thing. But I wonder if maybe you could share your own background. I know you did a degree at Kennedy and so forth. Why don't you share your own background, and then we'll talk a little bit about this unique organization that you're heading up and seems to be moving along so well. Okay. I uh, just finished a degree at the Kennedy School of Government, and before that I was a labor lawyer mm -hmm. in New York for unions and uh, also a public defender. And uh, before that I studied labor relations uh, in college, and I come from a labor family. Uh -huh. And you did a law degree? Yeah. Where did you do that, if I may? I, um, I went to SUNY Buffalo Law School in Columbia. Uh -huh. law school. Uh -huh. And then you got in, you were at the, at the Kennedy, and then you got the idea, you've come from uh, Cambridge to, to, to New York to start this organization, and if I'm not mistaken, you were inspired, I don't know if that's the right term, but at least uh, influenced by a professor at, 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 at Columbia that might be well worth mentioning. Sure. What happened was I was uh, a labor lawyer, yes. and seeing what was happening with the labor law laws at the time, that there was just something that didn't seem to really fit. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Kennedy School with the intention of studying labor policy. And when I got there, I happened to see a New York Times article written by Bob Herbert in a, uh, outlining this idea for what he called the jobs lobby. And he was saying, What's happening with workers? You know, the workforce is so docile as we hear of downsizing. And this was a year and a half ago. I see. And he mentioned Herb Gann's idea for a jobs lobby. Mm -hmm. And I read that and thought it was just a wonderful idea and got in touch with Herb Gann's and a bunch of people were talking about the idea and decided to leave school from a two-year to a one-year program. The school allowed me to transfer programs. And I started working on it since June. I see. And you were, you were looking at the situation in terms of the, the shifting role and the shifting situation as far as labor and the whole jobs question is concerned. Right. What, what really struck me was that there were these big changes that were happening in the, way that the, the ways that people were working, mm -hmm. but they really didn't have any kind of way, any organized voice to respond. So you look at the labor force now, about 13% are unionized, which mm -hmm. leaves 87% without any kind of representation. And if you actually start looking at the labor laws, less than half the people who work are even eligible to form unions. So really? when you, mm -hmm. the, actually the laws, the way they're written, actually define who's an employee. You know, you think because you work, therefore you're an employee, and mm -hmm. somehow it should be pretty obvious. But it's actually a very technical uh, little archaic piece of language that's in what's called the National Labor Relations Act, which governs labor law. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is because the laws and the regulations and the Internal Revenue Code are so out of date, they were designed to help workers, and now they're really hurting. And there's really no constituency group that's concerned and really wants to work on behalf of workers to bring them up to date to make them respond. What, what, what has happened uh, that has changed things so from the 1930s, as you say, labor relations board and so uh, to now. What, was the, what has happened that has changed things uh, so radically? Well, you know, there's probably just so many things, yeah. but one of the, the major things is really the nature of work itself has really changed. So when you think back to, let's say, when people really formed unions so, so strongly, it was in the 1930s, yeah. with a big manufacturing workplace, and you had all the structures really geared toward that kind of workplace. You had unions that could organize tens of thousands of workers by organizing auto, steel, industrial unions. Then you think about now, in the 1990s, the 1980s, how do people work? They tend to work all over the place. They're spread out geographically. Many people are working at home. Uh, people now uh, are more freelance. There's a whole transience in the way that people are working, which is, of course, something you know, that, that's very complicated about why that's happening. 
but there's no structure that can reach people in this new way that they're working. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're hoping to do at Working Today. Because, because the tradition of the unions would be unionizing the steel workers or the automobile workers or the, well, you had communications workers. But it's also people were at the workplace yeah. and they were there for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing now that people are changing jobs so frequently that they don't even have time to, let's say, have a pension that vests. So whereas before, you could tie compensation to an employer, and that made a lot of sense. Now, for instance, people, if their pensions, if they even are lucky enough to have pensions, and less than half the workforce is even with an employer-based pension. Mm -hmm. But of those, let's say, 50% that have them, they often leave before their pensions vest. So we're talking about people working and not having any kind of savings for their later years. Yeah, and they don't have medical coverage and benefits, what is generally called benefits as part of what was used to be collectively bargainable if you right. had a viable union. And the unions, the clout of the unions, some people think that the unions lost their clout, as we say, particularly after PAPCO and Mr. Reagan broke that mm -hmm. union and so forth, and that the, the unions have consistently lost power in order to affect things. Mr. Sweeney's just taken over and he claims to be militant and so what, do you think that there's a, the, the traditional AFL-CIO and the traditional union pattern is still, you say, the 13 percent, but can that be resurrected in some way? Or what relationship does your working today or this new workplace relate to and what can be learned from the traditional labor union movement? Well, you know, one thing that I think is really important to realize is unions have been around since the time of the Bible. And th it, saying something as a union is really just a way of saying people getting together to talk about what's happening with regard to work. So right now there's one predominant model, which is the industrial model, but we still have craft unions. We still have a lot of things that are going on all at the same time. Mm -hmm. what, what we need is to have the different structures speaking to different workers. There are plenty of people who are still working for an employer in a relationship that's going to last for you know several years. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in this country, we have what's called at-will employment, which means you can be fired for any reason unless it's based on discrimination or um, a legally prohibited reason. But it means you can be fired for any, any reason at all. So there really aren't protections for anyone unless you're unionized. Now, with regard to the AFL-CIO, I think there's a very exciting thing happening there because I think there's a real openness to thinking about how are we going to organize different types of people. Working today is not a union. We don't engage in collective bargaining. We're not competing with the AFL-CIO. Yeah. What we are saying is that there's another way that we can start talking about the changes that, that need to be made. So primarily, the, the concern that we really see is that employers now are preferring a flexible workforce. And it's not that people can work flexibly and then have health and pension uh, and decent full-time jobs. Statistically, this flexibility translates into lack of protection for any labor law, no health benefits, no pensions. And you have a tax code that encourages employers to provide these benefits and gives them incentives that they're not, they're not using. So even the tax code could be restructured and rerouted to the worker. So the worker could, let's say, take advantage of a health plan, a pension plan, and get the same write-offs that the employer gets. So there are a lot of creative things that we're suggesting that are, that's different than just the trade union AFL-CIO model. I see. Though some of those things are being actually considered in the Congress now, portability of some of these things and mm -hmm. so forth. From the employer's perspective, wouldn't it be because they do make contributions and have made contributions to these health plans and other quote-unquote benefits that the employees traditionally have had who were in their employ, mm -hmm. uh, to the degree that they can, in a certain sense, avoid paying anything like that in the name of uh, staying competitive in a brutally competitive world marketplace and that sort of thing, wouldn't it be at their advantage to just uh, not uh, face up to that responsibility at all and let the workers spend for themselves? Well, I guess it depends on, on where you're at in the equation. I mm -hmm. mean, right now we're... Uh, that 40, was from 40, the employer's perspective. Sure. I mean, I mean th right now, 40 million people, that's 40 million people who work and their families mm -hmm. have no health insurance. Um, less than uh, about five-sixths of the workforce is not in an employer-provided uh, pension program, mm -hmm. which means only one-sixth mm -hmm. is. That's interesting. So, you know, clearly from the employer's perspective, 
this is something that makes sense because it keeps the bottom line pretty bottom. Right. But we have to really ask ourselves, you know, what are, what are we as a society? And I think the message has really been to, to people who work, you know, look, you're, you're in this alone. You know, you can, you can do well in the marketplace, get the skills, get the education, and you'll be fine. But we're talking about a different work world now. And really, the savvy, the savvy person who works realizes they have to really be organized. And that means being involved in their professional association or being involved in their local political club, joining organizations, getting the skills, doing the networking. It really isn't a market where somebody can, can go it alone. Because employers may very well have those kinds of interests. But the people who work you know, have to really protect themselves and start thinking about what kind of society are we talking about for the majority of people, not just you know the, the few who, who are actually doing quite well in, in the economy now? Yeah, there's some at the top who are doing very well indeed, and the, some of the chief executives are getting paid out really incredibly high salaries. And those right. salaries, they, they, you see statistics about how much they've grown in percentage terms with the, with the rest of the working population, it's, it, 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 particularly in this country, I mean, and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, is this emerging as an issue now? Working today now is getting a great deal of attention, I know, mm -hmm. particularly a lot of press and a lot of attention. Uh, is this, and we just had this recent series that the New York Times gave an awful lot of space to on the downsizing right. issue, that sort of thing. Uh, is, this, is this beginning to emerge that, that people have been suffering this? Let's say some of those people in the middle, if that's the right term. This, the loss of the security, they've been suffering it almost in like what they call denial in a certain sense. And now they're beginning to wake up to the fact that there has to be some sort of an organized effort to offset the pretty well organized efforts of the, of the employers as a whole. They have the National Manufacturer of Manufacturers, right. American Chamber of Commerce, and other interests. They are ordinarily right. well organized and are in tune with the emerging global marketplace. But the workers en masse, almost like the uh, National Association of, what is it called, the AARP, uh, right, retired right. people or something like that. Is that a model that you have in mind? Right. We've yeah. been looking a lot at the AARP in the way that they've been able to organize people over 50 mm -hmm. and people who are across education levels, skill levels, geographically, some who are retired, some who are working. They've really found a way that really speaks to the, to the transience of, of the economy. And we've looked quite a bit at, at their model, and I think it makes sense so that we actually, our mission is to promote the interests of people who work through advocacy, education, and service. And we're putting together health and uh, retirement planning packages and prepaid legal services. And what we're trying to do is say two things. One, there are advocacy issues that really need to be addressed on behalf of people who work in this country. And the second is we want to try and meet some of those needs now, that if we pull our resources together, we can actually do better and take care of the things that employers used to provide. So for instance, our advocacy agenda focuses on what's happening to jobs, the decline of wages, the double taxation for independent contractors who have to pay two portions of Social Security tax, mm -hmm. which could be thousands of dollars a mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. and, and most importantly is calling for a completely portable system of benefits. And the way that it would work would be people would have pools associations that they could form that would meet IRS and Department of Labor regulations to ensure that they were, they were functioning properly. And the person could go from job to job and get credit for the amount of time worked. So let's say somebody worked in one place for a year, another place for a year and a half. The fund would take care of it. Would, would that be like a 401k, accrued. or is that, am I off base on that? No, no, the 401k is in some ways, a 401k is just a, an, it, an employer, it's or, through an employer, yeah. and you can put pre-tax dollars away. And if you go to another employer who has the 401k, it's portable. Well, if the employer doesn't, the next employer doesn't have it, it's not portable. I see. So what we're saying is, look at, there are several models, yeah. the, the uh, TIAA CREF which is for university employees all across the country and in research institutions. They can go anywhere, uh, anywhere in the country, and their fund keeps track of their annuity, which is their pension. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the guilds always work like this, yeah. the unionized construction trade, because somebody would work three weeks on one project, eight months on another project, and the fund would keep track of the accrual. And then at the time of retirement, the person would get paid. And what we're saying is, you know, and I don't think there's any disagreement on this. I mean, you know, it's everybody agrees that people should get 
get credit for the amount of time worked. It's just how do you do it? And employers are increasingly saying, we don't want the responsibility. So what we're saying is, OK, employers, if you're saying that the social contract has changed, mm -hmm. the relationship is over, and we're in this new work world, yeah. then you, ha you have to lose some of the things like the incentives that went along with it. And they need to be rerouted to allow workers to get the tax credits for providing the health, the pension, uh, in pre-tax dollars or in post-tax dollars. Mm -hmm. But it really makes sense to try and to go back to the legislative intent of the 1930s and make that intent apply to now. So there's a considerable amount that can be done legislatively and in cooperation with the government, isn't right. it? Right. Were you greatly disappointed that the health care plan that Mr. Clinton had proposed was not able to come to fruition and we're still swimming around in a situation where we don't have, we're an industrial nation without a what's seen by many as a comprehensive health care system that could have met those criteria in a, mm -hmm. for free-floating people in a free-floating, angst-filled society. Right. I mean, I think that whatever plan, that you know, the, it could have been the Clinton plan, there could have been a number of plans. I mean, it's pretty, dis it's pretty disastrous yeah, that we couldn't failed, come up with yeah. anything. Yeah. Because what, what I think is the most profound thing, aside from the 40 million number, which is pretty yeah. horrible, because if it you is. think about it, there are 150 million people who work in this country, mm -hmm. and 40 million, don't have, 40 million in their families don't have health insurance. But also, you think about the people who, in effect, are tied into a job because they can't leave because they have a pre-existing condition. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if we think about that, you know, for a moment, you think sort of like of Dickens. Yes, I, th I was know? going to say Dickens and, or and Blake, the, yes. I think uh. we've gotten to a point in 1996 where, you know, look at how many kids now are working. You know, how many, what, we've, we've gone back to having, you know, sweatshops all over. P how many yes. people work an eight-hour day? Mm -hmm. You know, 1884 was the year there was, uh, you know, we called for an eight-hour day. That mm -hmm. was something that Americans fought for. Mm -hmm. How many people do you know work only eight hours now? I mean, we've really gotten away from the things that we always sort of took pride in as a country. And we really have to go back to thinking about what are the things that really benefit, you know, the vast majority of us. Right. Now, people who are, let's say, Shumpeter or some other kinds of people who traditionally are like capitalists, who, who, is there, is there a, is there a, um, an enemy? in this development, or is it something that's sort of in a certain sense the, re the inevitable result of uh, the Silicon Revolution and the technological development and the displacement of workers who did work and labor contribution to production by technology? Is that one thing that's causing that? Is it the globalization? Is, it a, is there a, a, an enemy group that can be identified, or how do we put our arms around this great big question, you know, collectively as a society and almost in a sociological well, way. You know, I think what's clear to me from talking to many people is they feel this tremendous fatalism that there's this thing out there called globalization and it's like a natural occurring disaster like yeah. a hurricane. Yeah. And I think what would be more useful is to realize that these are the results of policy choices. And when I say that I mean that human beings are making decisions that will affect all of us. And if human beings are making those decisions then we can increasingly start playing a role in it. We do, we are faced with a tough a tough problem, and that tough problem means that as corporations are going global, it's very easy for them to just move around searching for the best business conditions, which don't always translate into the best jobs, you know, that have security and, and the kinds of benefits we've counted on. But, you know, and as a country and as, as a world, we've faced very hard problems before it. You know, we've eradicated smallpox. There have been diseases, you know. We fought World War II. Just because things are hard doesn't mean people should feel this kind of fatalism. Really what they should be doing is realizing that they're not alone. Right now, this problem is affecting almost everybody, if not each individual, each family is being touched by this. And the solutions are to try and join together and to, to start saying, if these are human, human being problems and the result of decisions, then I as an individual will join in a group and we can start making a difference and start calling for changes. And I think people should be encouraged by a number of things. L number one, I think the press should really be saluted for the work that they've done in, in putting this issue on the agenda. And if you see what happened with AT&T, th they just started taking out one page ad saying, hey, it's not 40,000 that we're laying off, it's actually only a smaller percentage and saying we're doing all these things in terms of outplacement. Why that's important is it shows that corporations heard. 
there's a level of shame now associated with being one of the corporations who lay people off. The business week, you know, the business press is putting people on the front page as calling them shredders. You know, you know, I don't think people want to go home and have their children ask them if they're a shredder. Yeah, but on the other hand, the, the, the business, the, 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 the uh, people who are responsible for the management of a corporation, if they have a technologically augmented system, switching systems are amazing. These silicon-based switching systems that can displace people, and do we not want to have a global marketplace where we can, you know, it would be like saying, all the manufacturing in Illinois has to be here and you can't build down in Tennessee, you know, not cross barriers. And there's an autarky kind of pattern and everything like that. But don't you want the business managers to be able to have the freedom to seek out and to build the most effective uh, system that they possibly can right. without uh, building, uh, make work into that in the name of some sort of, uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do you understand what I'm sure. saying? They have to be, and if they don't, uh, somebody from Hong Kong or somebody from somewhere else is going to do that and they're going to be out of uh, business. Don't you, we want the, the pressure and the, and the competition of the marketplace to bring about efficiencies that are there in the long run? See, I think there's an assumption there that, that businesses are now acting in, in the most efficient manner. And in fact, if you read The Economist and a lot of, uh, a lot of the literature in the business community, especially Peter Drucker, yeah. they're saying this kind of downsizing, which is a euphemism for just you know, massive firing, is what what this really is is inefficient because they're not looking at how businesses can actually work well if you cut out such large segments of your workforce you're not looking at how you can streamline it in a way that really makes sense so for instance I think you can say that business t to some extent of course needs flexibility because they should that's what they're in the business of doing is is producing a product and that's what makes jobs. And effectively. Right. And the technology but, can take the place of people. Well, and if well, it can, oughtn't it be able to? I don't really agree with the assumption no. that your the technology is going to offset uh, labor. You know, I think you're always going to need people. But let me just say that you're not having technology take the place of labor, and the people who are working are working, you know, eight hours a day. You're seeing now that there are two there are two groups of people. They're either the people who are, you know, out of work or in these contingent jobs and the people who are incredibly overworked. You know, Forbes magazine had a great, I think it was Forbes, had a great advertisement. It was either you're laid off on Friday or overworked on Monday. Mm -hmm. So there's a real problem in just the technology argument because people, people are really getting whipsawed through the economy. Employers can have a certain degree of flexibility, but we're, in a, we're a society, a society that's made up of a number of different communities communities of people who work, communities of business, the government. We're a complicated mass of, of different organizations, and that's the role of, of government in a society, is to start balancing those very many interests. So that, sure, business has to be responsible to their shareholders, but they don't yeah. have a right to pollute. We make certain decisions. True. We say True. there are certain regulations because you know business X might do very well by you know leaking toxic chemicals everywhere. They but they the can't, communities they can't employ little children right. who are you know eight year olds or something. We got that kind of thing we voted through, right? Right. That, so that was a policy decision made by socially by the by right. the political process. Right. And I think that once people start realizing you know there's stuff we can do here. You know it's not like we have to all be reactive. You know, it's actually much, it, it can be hopeful. I mean, not to be, you know, Pollyanna, but there are mm. things that we can be doing. There are mm. solutions like a, a portable system of benefits, really looking at what's happening with, with laying off different types of people, starting to raise the level of concern when, when this happens, looking to employers that don't, making consumer type decisions about supporting those products that really are not made um, by companies that have a, a, a history of laying people off. You know, I don't think we have to fight change. I think we have to work with it. Well, okay, Mr. Shum Peter might turn over his grave a little bit, and some other kinds of people who see that there's this uh, creative uh, destruction that happens in the process, and it, you know, it's given over to where it has to do that. One wonders the the agricultural workers were taken off the land with the cotton gin, and the you know, and the and there's been a process like that to where they've been displaced. Aristotle himself in the politics said that uh, Athens uh, was based, uh, apparently in Greece, was based on, they had the citizens, it was based on a slave society, and he, they needed that for some citizens to be able to live well. 
And he said, so it shall be always until such time as the loom learns to weave or the plectrum learns to play. If we do that, then we could free people. I guess I you just don't think don't it's feel, possible. I don't, I don't have such a deterministic view about yeah. technology. And I think that we're clearly in a, a time of, of great change and transformation. But that's life. You know, industrialization took people from rural areas to the city. Right. But each time people found a way, governments found a way to start balancing the interests. I think that we really have to get back to this idea that these are decisions made by people. And we have to get involved to start saying these decisions aren't working for the majority of us. There's something very wrong in a society when people are working two and three jobs and having no benefits. When you have this whole, con whole rise in a working poor. You mm. know, we talk about welfare and people who are going to go from welfare to work. You know, we, we don't have any real jobs policy. You know, I think what would make people feel very uh, much more at ease is if we heard that there was going to be a job czar, there was going to be a Manhattan Project for jobs, where we were going to really look at this as a societal problem. Because that's what it is. And anyone who thinks that this is just a simple problem that's just going to go away, you know, or it's just something that's simple and there's an easy answer, I think just is someone people should run away from very quickly because it's complicated. So you don't think the normal thing where the agricultural workers went to Mr. Ford's factory and then they went into the service and the, the normal course of new jobs being created, which has been part of the belief, that we've come into a structural problem, something structurally new. And I guess I was asking what that structural new thing, if it isn't technological displacement. Well, you know, if you actually look at it, the, the statistics are that 12 percent of 12% of the domestic goods are affected by the global market. That means 88% are not affected. That doesn't mean that globalization is not an issue, but that we have to start looking at what's fact and what's fiction. What's more a reality is that the, the policies that are in place now aren't, aren't supporting people in the way they work the way they were before. It's not, we're not talking about an economy that's affected 90% by global products. It's no, I didn't, I, I didn't mean to say necessarily that it was, uh, it was uh, only uh, the globalization. I mean, that can be a rationale where you're going to develop external markets, you're going to develop emerging markets, because Mr. Ruther used to say to Mr. Ford and Mr. Wilson that he'd pay him $5 a day in order to create autarkically the market to buy that which mass produce could be done, and they're going to undercut their market if their money is not in the hands of people so, who so can buy them on Henry, a world scale. Henry Ford's idea that you have to pay workers enough money so they can buy the cars. Well, I he did, and Walter Ruther would raise that money, too, and there's a legitimacy to it. Probably the gro we're only growing 2.1% now and probably a good deal has to do with the fact that there's a lack of purchasing power among so many people to buy that which we're technologically capable of producing. But I wasn't necessarily saying it's only globalization that mm -hmm. is there, that's part of it. But what I'm saying is it's technological displacement of people, robotics, cybernation, these kind of switching mm -hmm. systems and information systems, that the people who have been needed traditionally to produce goods and services and so forth are not going to be needed. And if the robot can do it, or the robotized system can do it, do we want to not do it in a Luddite way? Do we want to say that we won't allow those technological systems to advance because we're, we have to distribute income to these workers so that the workers are there doing, um, I forget what the term for it is, but it's uh, doing work that isn't really necessary. Feather bedding. Feather bedding is the word, yeah. Well, nobody is saying that, you know, we're, that a, we have to slow down uh, automation, that we have to make They're it not? so that... No, see, I don't think that we have, to, we have to say that we're going to make four people work when really two are, are only necessary. But I think that what we need to be saying is there are very big changes in the economy. There are very big changes in the way that people are working. We can either just let people be whipsawed through the economy and who's ever left standing is going to be okay, or we can say... This does not make sense. Well, that's why we have a democracy and a government. That's why groups get together and start calling on the democracy to be responsive. You know, they say when there's a problem, you say, ouch, and the system responds. Right now, we have a system of individuals who are just saying, ouch, but individuals can't be heard 
the way a group is heard. That's what you're trying to do with your and group, like the AARP. Like yeah. any group. Look at yeah. Mothers Against Drunk Driving. They've right. been phenomenally successful at raising the issue and getting laws enforced that, that are on the books. There are a lot, the environmental movement. You know, every time we've seen there's an ouch, we see the system respond. And I think that's what people need to see. But because only half the people are allowed to form unions and many people don't like unions or can't join or for whatever reason, we need other ways to make it so that people can register their concerns. And you know, if there's one lesson that we've really learned in this country, if people aren't included and aren't represented, you know, the, it's when they're outside and they don't get a chance to participate that we see, you know, the, the scary things that we see. Yeah. And uh, politically, it'll reach a certain point. They can be in denial for so long, maybe, and then there's so many people doing well and that kind of thing. Mr. Dole didn't even recognize when he went up in New Hampshire. Some people were having trouble. It was a little bit unusual that that was recognized. But uh, at a certain point, poli or, or you can try and develop emerging markets. And, uh, but some people would say that the American worker has been overpaid in terms of their contribution to what's been going on. And it's just that the market of the world is now adjusting itself. And we must inevitably bring our standard down. And the world standard will come up, just like Tennessee came up to meet the standard of Illinois. And there will be a balancing of that. And Americans are crying out because they've been vastly overpaid and pampered all these years. Well, you know, the problem with that argument, of course, is that executive compensation has continued to rise. The economy is actually doing quite well. You know, there yes. always had been a relationship between wages and productivity, so that when productivity rose, wages rose. That's Total sort of been the implicit bargain. And what we're seeing now is productivity is very high. The economy is doing well. The only group that's not doing well are people who work, and especially, well, now it's actually across the board. And there are many reasons for it. I mean, people. It's not just that wages are stagnating, but that people are now having to buy on the market the things they used to get from their employer, namely the health, the yeah, pensions, right. the other things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's 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 actually, you know, it's 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 a big problem. It is a big problem, and it's probably maybe it's the major problem confronting mankind. You know, but you you don't think that there's something to be said. What about the fact you said it's doing very well, and the chief executives are doing well, stock options and so forth, and the people who own the robots, who is relatively small as a group in our society, is very, very small. You don't think there's anything to be said for we might have movements to expand ownership of the robots, which are actually producing goods and services, what, what and distribute. Well, if you have an ownership of a robot, you own the robot. You have the stock ownership of the robot that's producing goods and services. You get income because you have that ownership stake. But the ownership is limited to such a small group, relatively small group, despite, I think, what Mr. Drucker might say and so forth. But that, it's so, that the ownership is so small. But most people don't think about getting income for life's purposes, like paying rent and other kinds of things, by having a viable holding of capital assets of the robots that are producing the wealth. And then you don't think there's any, like the ESOP movement, the United Airlines and Avis and so mm -hmm. forth, it's a small beginning of beginning to expand ownership beyond the traditional ownership class rather than just talking about jobs, 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 which mm -hmm. are going to be eliminated perhaps by technological systems of production that don't need people in a mass-produced system. You know, I think if ESOPs work, you know, anything that works, that's great. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's exciting that United Airlines people bought the airline and you know, let's hope that it's, it's viable. But I think there are other ways that are actually, you know, easier that we can look at that start mm -hmm. making sense. I mean, if you actually look at what people have been putting on the agenda through this lens, mm -hmm. you start seeing the interpretation a bit differently. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the reasons that people have been so upset about paying taxes is that the tax burden is really hurting the working, the working poor, the people who were traditionally middle class. They're paying double Social Security often. They're really, as a, as a group, getting so hard hit. The whole need for looking at values. I think people are just very insecure. They don't know what the future is going to bring. And I think it tends to be much more an economic problem than people realize. Yeah. I think economics has really been overlooked for probably 50 years. Absolutely. Couldn't know, agree really with you more. I was just trying to say in a certain sense that the traditional economics, whether it's Keynes or whether it's Marx or Schumpeter or 
all of the neo-Keynesian, the neoclassical, or the traditional economic philosophies that have been employed to try and understand the man-milieu relationship and so forth seem not to be working for a great number of people. And I was suggesting the, the idea, and they, they never, we, our policy is the Employment Act of 1946. We will distribute income by employment criteria. Mr. Clinton says we will create jobs, and everyone says we will create jobs. But it's the actually the technology that's doing the wealth, and the ownership is becoming narrower and narrower and narrower. And no one brings up the question of who owns that, which is actually doing the production. That's the only thing I'm saying. So that would be a new way of looking at things, rather than the traditional economics of the Democrats and the Republicans trickle down tax and spend and the right. traditional political uh -huh. dialogue that is there. Right. So I'm looking for something different than the traditional. Right. You know, I guess I, I'm not convinced about the, the robot idea here, but I think that it's really clear that we're, we're heading into a time that we need to be seeking solutions. And yes. I think one of the things, you know, you mentioned health care earlier, but a, as a real example of where we could have come up with something. It's just, it's just inexcusable. And I think people see, they say to themselves, you know, our, our elected politicians, you know, in the viewpoint and the ideology are really not that different. Why is it that we can't get some kind of working thing going on here? And I think we're going to really be heading into a new time. I think politics is really changing. Right. And I think that instead of this sort of conservative liberal, right. it's going to be much more about, you know, what constituency group are you concerned with? Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about what's happening to the fate of people who are working? Right. Many or of whom disagree very extremely, absolutely. but as a group really need some attention. And yeah. I think that's hopefully where the politics is going. Yeah, the politics and also perhaps in the media, as you said, there could be a tete-a-tete -tete or a real discussion about this that isn't limited to the conventional wisdom that is ensconced within most of our institutions and inherited systems and way of thinking. We might come from philosophers, and then it, it might come from some places like that. And also, uh, it, you, you, we didn't get a chance to mention very much ecology or the broader mm -hmm. context, or maybe the broader context of what's taking place in terms of our relationship to the, to the, the, to the whole question of uh, our coming into some sort of a new relationship that is very existentially challenging to the whole human society. It might be very liberating in a way, but calls for a new way of thinking than and when Mr. Galileo said we go around uh, the sun and not the other way around, people were very upset, but it might be that kind of a time. That, do you understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying? In a, in, a, in a very, very large sense, it might be calling for that. And you're moving, it seems to me that you're doing what you're doing. I congratulate you, because you took, you took and jumped into, a, into, a, into the confusion, as, uh, Mr., uh, as, they, as uh, some might say. You jump into the conclusion and began to address the problem and set up an institution that could help people who are real human beings who are really beginning to hurt and, uh, and, and helping them in an ongoing way. Could you really quickly give your address and so oh, sure. I know you I'd have to run to, to catch a, sure. an appointment, but uh, you're in New York here. Yeah, so where people can contact us at Box 681, Times Square Post Office, New York, New York, 10108. And then you get a phone, don't you? It's 212 840 6066, and of course we ask that if there's an answering machine, just leave your name slowly. Right, and you need you need people who can help people with artistic skills, people with some ideas, people with um, financial sports, always good, right. uh, or people who can help get the word out. And right. so it's, a, it's a voluntary kind of situation. Right, and right. we have um, a, a number of volunteers, a board of directors, but we're always looking for additional help. Our dues are ten dollars a year, mm -hmm. and uh, probably within the next six eight months, we'll be able to really start offering sp specific things like the uh, retirement plans, health, and uh, prepaid legal services. Well, I think you've been on top of that already, and that's beginning to come out in the Congress. Now you're already getting support for this idea of portability of right. some of these things, and right. to and to get a better situ working situation for the people who are in these freelance situations, and they need some sort of a help, and if only they could have places together where they can begin to get together right. and talk about some of these things and maybe get beyond the denial stage, if that's right. what it has been for some of these people who've been affected by it. And your organization seems to me to be doing that very, very well. well Sorry we've run short of time here, but I want to thank you, Sarah, My very, pleasure. very Thanks much. So much. I congratulate you very much on what you've been able to accomplish, and I remind you, it's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Sarah Horwitz, and she's president of Working Today here in New York City and a major organization that looked at a major problem. There'll be 
More coming up in the same general theme um, uh, momentarily, so we ask you in conversations to stay tuned. But that's it for this particular segment. Uh, Sarah, again, congratulations on having gotten the ball rolling, and may you do well. And it is, as Bob Herbert said, something to be cheered for, I think is what he said, or to be given support of. And I would agree with Mr. Herbert on that and uh, so forth. So please stay tuned. We'll be coming back. And again, Sarah, thank you very, very much for coming in. Coming right back. Welcome to the program now. Uh, Paul Chapman, he's the director of the Employment Project. And uh, Paul, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Fine. Nice, to, to, nice to be here, to Harold. And Thank to you. to the uh, Manhattan Network. Uh, this uh, question we were just chatting off, uh, maybe off, uh, you know, before we began here, this question of the downsizing and the problem of employment in our society is one that apparently you have been involved with and concerned with over a considerable period of time. And this employment project uh, is something that uh, came from your earlier work and your concern with some of these issues? Well, I was working with merchant seafarers. Yeah. And uh, they were being downsized as global economy allowed uh, ship owners to hire laborers abroad, mm -hmm. especially from Asia. And rather quickly, we went from uh, 60,000 merchant seafarers in this country down to maybe 12 and down to 5,000 active seafarers now. That's interesting, yeah. And ship owners were able to hire from Asia, from uh, the Philippines and Bangladesh and so on. Mm -hmm. And that, that was like uh, they were hiring from other parts of the world where things were less costly. They, uh, they went to those countries where the wages are lowest and unemployment's highest. And did we not have in the transportation also a, a certain revolution in terms of containerization, other kinds of technologically based? Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly the longshoremen had a face this early issue well, and so forth. On board ship, mm -hmm. uh, w w containerization meant that far uh, fewer uh, seafarers could do the work that used uh -huh. to be done. The, sh the bridges are now all uh, technologically very sophisticated. The engine room in some ships uh, is unmanned, mm -hmm, as they mm -hmm. say. No one even goes into the engine room where it used to have a dozen or 15 engineers uh, around the clock. Mm -hmm maintaining the machinery. Do you, do you think it is possible that, I, I know it was Harry Bridges and these fellows out on the West Coast mm -hmm. and that sort of thing worked some pr problems out, but it was so obvious that with containerization there was going to be a technologically induced inability of having jobs that used to be there That's for right. the longshoremen right. unloading yeah. ships and so forth. Do you think, and the, do you think that that is now, and now you're addressing with the employment uh, project um, uh, this, this question that is surfacing in the popular consciousness even now that people are being laid off en masse in what had been middle class jobs and so forth. Some people say it's because we're shipping jobs offshore in a global economy. Other people say it is because the technological ability to get things done by technological systems that do not require labor is something that is an inevitable process that is overtaking our pattern which had been based on, uh, on uh, the job input to the productive process. Uh, I wonder. Well, how do you feel about Yeah, that? in addition to the technological issue and the globalization issue, sending jobs abroad, I think there's a third factor, and that's a kind of attitudinal uh, position. That is, we don't think of labor when we put together our economy. Mm -hmm. It's said that uh, the priorities of our corporate structure are, first of all, the investors, secondly, the consumers, and thirdly, the workers. Whereas in some uh, economies, the workers come first. When I went on to uh, uh, an Indian ship recently, for example, there were 60 people doing what could be done by 15 mm -hmm. if we wanted uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. And I said to the chief uh, mate, how come you have so many people on board? We could do this with 15 people. He said, ah, but we're more efficient. We can find work for 60 people. Yeah. So it's a matter also of priorities. Are laborers important? Are right. jobs, jobs important? That is, an impor that is an important philosophical question that That's confronts right. us. Now, right. if we are in a situation, let's say, uh, where the, uh, the job could be done by 15, yes. or as you yes. had an analogy where, and let's just be wildly speculative okay. here on the human condition and so forth, and we have it down to where the job or the actual production of some good or service could be done by 15 or 30, or could be done by none. Right. And it could be done by robots. It right. could be done by machines. Sure. And you could free people from doing things that they had. And, uh, you know, and you were able to realize that technological efficiency. 
is this something that we should not go and realize if we can to realize the technological efficiency because the social inequities that would result from that with the technology all being owned by a relative handful of people and uh, everyone depending upon jobs for income in order to live decent human lives, that we can't allow ourselves to realize our technological efficiencies because we need to allow people to become surrogate robot functions with an economic process? Well, or uh, how do we deal with it? This is a uh, fundamental yeah. question that's confronting mankind. Well, let's say that uh, the most important uh, factor in production, mm -hmm. in the economy, in life, mm -hmm. uh, is people. I mean, you could say, uh, the environmentalists could say it's, it's life. Yes, right. But, but I don't argue with that. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, we're talking about productive process, let's say it's people. Mm -hmm. So let's structure the economy so that people uh, are most, uh, come first. Now, um, some countries are saying, in order to preserve the jobs of people, because we, are, I, we identify ourselves by our jobs, I mean, the second thing I ask you when I get to know you is, what do you do? You know, that's how I uh, get acquainted with you. That's how I identify myself. So let's structure the economy in a way that people feel good about what they're doing. In some cases, that might mean the 30-hour work week in order that the jobs could be preserved. And this is happening in some economies. Mm -hmm. That it could be done by overtime work, uh, fewer people working 60 hours. But perhaps it could, we could find jobs for more people. It doesn't mean changing. Uh, eliminating technological advance at all, but it means balancing the needs of people uh, with the needs of making a, a, a lot of profit. And right now, profit has taken over our society. Yeah, and that profit goes into the coffers of a relatively few people who That's own the investors, who the, own the inve the right. who own the technological means of production. And workers are uh, disposable parts. Well. I know, and I think perhaps that's what we're getting at, because in this equation, it is assumed that we're going to continue to distribute income to the mass of the society, and it's the only side of the equation that seems to be addressed in this discussion uh, by, by, by jobs, yeah. by labor. That's all we've got to make a living. Well, there things. is the possibility. Those people who have an ownership of the robot, or should we invalidate that principle, I wonder? People who own the robot or own the technology which if we were impartial in that analogy of 30, 15 to zero, as you had, in terms of what could be done, if we were impartial in our observation of that, that the real production, the source of the production is not the people. There are factories that are run with no people now. It's the robot. And does the person who owned the robot have a legitimate claim upon income? And if they do have, is it possible to spread ownership of the robots as a way of distributing income so that people could become uh, leisured or and at least with sufficient means of living so that they could lead full lives rather than doing these uh, being ground up as ser performing surrogate robot functions with an economic process that will grind them up as the robots continually take over because they're trying to do something that's not in the cards as it were in terms of economic, social, political development. They could pre be free for voluntary human activity, which is not based upon money or based upon you know, economic rationales between them in a voluntary section of the society. Right, right now, the way the pie is being divided is that the guy who rose, uh, owns the robot is taking all the income. Yeah, and that's uh, owned by relatively few people. But, but is that question one that ought to be addressed? Absolutely. Who owns the technology or the capital yeah. asset? Who, yeah, and capital is stored up labor. Well, that's one surplus value theory yeah, of labor I mean, that people uh, that, have. That yeah. people, if people contributed uh, to the evolution mm -hmm. of that robot. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now our productivity is, is growing. Mm -hmm. Some people say it's not growing as fast as it did in the past. But in any case, it's labor who are working, uh, who are contributing to that increased productivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, if people are important, then they should be the beneficiaries of this progress. Rather than the few, I think it should be more equitably distributed. That's my Yeah, that's my right. Principle. And of course, that's what the Employment Project is looking at in human terms, because human beings are being ground up by this Absolutely. process that is going on now. And you address that, and you, you, you enlist, within the, enlist within the Employment Project a good deal of the clergy and clergy, a concern of clergy and other concerned citizens about the plight, plight of people whose lives are being terribly disrupted by this downsizing this, this, this advance of, uh, 
of uh, inequity that's, and it's becoming politically relevant as it comes into the middle classes increasingly. What, bothered, what has bothered me in the past is that uh, we've been told that it's very easy to get a job these days. Uh, although there are 43 million jobs that have been uh, eliminated in the past uh, years, mm -hmm. still Clinton says he's created uh, 8 million new jobs. Mm -hmm. No argument with that. Yeah. But the quality of these jobs is discre de decreasing. Mm -hmm. uh, the income is going down. Un you yes. can quote statistics yes. on any side of this, but yes. that I'm quite convinced of that, mm -hmm. that the people are working hard, harder, women are coming on board to help supplement family income, and still family income decreases. Mm -hmm. So we're in a, a crisis of income. Mm -hmm. so we're in a crisis of uh, uh, people not feeling good about their jobs, and a lot of people are just plain losing them or keeping them for much shorter times. Yes. And uh, if jobs are so important to our daily lives and to our survival, then uh, we've got to address this uh, issue. Uh, yeah, that uh, the jobs just aren't playing the role that they used to play. Yeah, well, they are. They, they are this is now becoming politically relevant. Mr. Dole was surprised to find out when Mr. Buchanan won the New Hampshire vi uh, primary that, that there was a problem. Jobs you know, are important. Were, yeah, because the, yeah. the in economic indicators all look good in the traditional view That's of right. things and so forth. And we're coming into a presidential election, and we've had traditionally tax and spend on the social side of the democratic side, and we have trickle-down notions of supply side and so forth. And those two patterns seem to be in the personage of Mr. Clinton and Mr. Dole coming to be the context within which the election will proceed, proceed without there being the need to address things in any kind of qualitatively new way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's no new vision or new answers or new mm -hmm. analysis and so forth. It's going to be done within the Keynesian analysis or within the traditional analysis by which economics is done. And I wonder, do you think that we will be able to muddle through and find a solution that's going to address systemically this, this structural problem within the context of the traditional politics that is being advanced? I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. if, what if we had 50% uh, unemployment in this country? Oh, um, wow. You uh, get a reaction? A then? friend of mine says that, the, that we should look at uh, black uh, young men as the kind of uh, miner's canary for white young men in our society. Mm -hmm. um, if there are no jobs, then what does that do to us as a society mm -hmm. and as people? Rifkin says we're going to have fewer and fewer jobs. Well, but Jeremy Rifkin's end of book, we've been touting that book ever since it came out and been touting the idea that we need some sort of a change. Uh, yes, Ronald Woods has written on it very well, yes, and others has, have, yeah. and they write on this question. But again, I, I don't know. I, I am interested in it for 22 years, except I've been interested in the idea that instead, I mean, if you're going to have contribution to the, if if you're going to distribute on the on the social side, let's say uh, according to need, and people's needs must be met. Mm -hmm. I mean that's mm -hmm. a social responsibility right. we can right. politically have. Or are you going to contribute? Are you going to distribute the production on the basis of people's contribution to production, mm -hmm. which is what you do if you mm -hmm. have a, a job? You you have a you know, well, but if can you do both? <laughs> well, if well, that's what we've done, yeah. that's what we have done, haven't which, we? Which and we've tried to we've tried to to fill the gap uh, with with uh, you know governmental social policy and so forth on the basis of need. But if if it is true that the technology is able to be increasingly displacing of the labor, we have a structural problem that our traditional trickle down from a few people owning everything mm -hmm. to the one of taxing and spending. Neither one of those two problems will work. And I, I don't know, I, I'm sort of interested in this question about how are you going to, you, you, the, 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 the ownership of those in technological instruments, we seem never to, in the dialogue, we seem never to address the idea that how can we gain increased ownership, or is it appropriate that we gain an ownership stake in the part of the, democratize yeah. the ownership as a way of distributing income to people, rather than talking only about trying to have them become competitive in a, in a way to a technological system that is out, the whole purpose of the technological revolution is to put people out of work. It is. Our, st our economy is structured and it should to be. eliminate jobs. Yeah, but and I'm we should put people out I'm of very work, interested perhaps, in, in the long uh, term, if we have an alternative way to distribute the product. I've been interested in the, the Pope's encyclical from 1981 called On Human Work, in yes. which he uh, underscored the the fact that, in one sense, we should all be working for ourselves. Yes. That is, we should feel so much a part of the ownership of the means of production that we had a sense of our own investment in our in our own job uh, s 
situation. And, he, and, and in a sense, he calls for a joint ownership of mm. the means of production so that we feel that, that we're working for ourselves. We're working for the common good, or, but we're part of it. Or, per, or perhaps if they had an ownership of the capital assets of the mass-produced economy that is being done by robots, that then would give them a source of income that would make them free to be able to do what it is they want to yeah. do and in a certain sense, they wouldn't have to become what Marx would have called wage slaves or surrogate robots well, or something. But that issue seems never to surface in the, 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 in the dialogue. It's only how can we create jobs, get 30 people doing what 15 could do, what zero could do, yeah. because we have no alternative way yeah. to distribute income. Well, right now, what we're, what's happening, of course, is people are feeling very much outside Absolutely. of the process. They're simply trying to get a job in order to survive. They have no... Right. access to decision, right. decision making, right. they're left behind. Yeah. And, well, 20% uh, uh, of the population does very well. Yeah. The 80% do poorer and poorer yeah. because they, they don't have access. And we have an absolute responsibility, social responsibility, to try to address that tremendous alienation if, if, if that we is want there. A, if we want an equitable society, if we, if we, want, want, a dem if we want a democracy, if we want then a dem people have got to feel they're a part of it. Right. And right now they're feeling increasingly isolated from uh, the economy. That's right. And, uh, and, and they're suffering in real they're human hurting. terms. They're, hurt, uh, they're suffering, they're in despair, and they're enraged. Mm -hmm. I, I run groups of unemployed people mm -hmm. who are feeling terribly uh, disenfranchised but also angry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of free-floating rage mm -hmm. uh, at all, uh, you know, in all segments of society. If you get laid off and you got a mortgage and you can't meet that mortgage and mm -hmm. you're wondering where you're going to live next, you have to pull your kids out of school because right. you don't have the tuition anymore. Yeah. You know that the society is in some way falling apart. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. It's very serious. Yeah, it I is. Think it's and far it more serious than the politicians have been able to articulate. Yeah, they haven't been able to articulate nor understand, nor people who are in a comfortable position have a hard time understanding that because they haven't lived it. And most, They're comfortable. And most of those who are defining our society are comfortable. That's right. So the definition isn't accurate. It doesn't fit the majority the increasing majority of people. Yeah, so, so there's, an, there's an important thing that you, Sarah Horowitz, yeah. and other people are beginning to try and set up interest groups that can represent this mass of the people. That's right. And if the politics doesn't respond to it, they could begin to, to, you know, we have to start doing things on an ad hoc basis or I think the, something to I, meet the need. I think the militia movement reflects this kind of white, free-floating male anger. Anger. People scapegoat rather than knowing how to address the uh, the system in any analytical way. Yeah, and that's uh, that's likely to grow uh, because uh, uh, unless seems uh, unless our system changes. Somehow. Yeah, they're trying to make some changes, uh, lowering the uh, you know the uh, bringing up the uh, the uh, the wage scale and these kind of things, Mr. Yeah, Kennedy just a talked about wage. favored. It's called yeah. a living wage. Baltimore, yeah. for example, that yeah. uh, requires those who do business with the government uh, to get six dollars an hour instead of four twenty-five right. minimum and wage. And some of these things. And this is going to be part of the dialogue that's going to be discussed. It and is. then there will be some people trying to discuss it in a, a larger systems understanding of what the world is going on and understanding it. And we've got to do both at the same time. Yeah. We've got to try to hear the mer merit needs and get the long-term yeah. perspective. And one of the long-term perspectives is Increase, we don't know. But the increasing number of people are feeling the pain. Absolutely. And, uh, and they're looking for new answers. All right. Yeah. And this is it. And uh, the employment project is one important thing. We'd like to just let people know uh, about it. Maybe quick give the phone number here in New York. It's 212-533-6945. Uh, huh? Four five. Okay, a very, very, very good organization that is trying to work along, and Sarah Horwitz and others that are trying to work and address this problem that's so obvious in our society. And uh, the guest has been, I'm sorry it's so short, but it's Paul Chapman, he's the director of the Employment Project here in New York addressing these questions. Uh, thank you very much for viewing, and uh, Paul Th Chapman, thank you very, very much for coming in. It's been a pleasure talking with you. My pleasure, Harold. And we'll see you again next week, so that's it for this particular program. See you then, and uh, Mr. Chapman, once again, thank you very, very much indeed. You're welcome. Until next time.